even within the realm of cryptozoology, there are creatures that seem to defy easy classification. And some believe there's a distinct line between the field of cryptozoology, which by definition deals with undiscovered organisms which are real, flesh and blood animals, that of paranormal phenomena, and that of folklore. While they may at times cross paths or briefly converge, typically these fields are as different as night and day, and deal with entirely different sets of phenomena, with different areas of study, classifications, methods, aims, and goals. Yet there are times when the gulf between them is not clear-cut, when something that on the surface appears to be an uncategorized animal evades such a simple identification. One such enigmatic beast has surely got to be the infamous Black Hellhounds, a unique category of creature so bizarre that it transcends any attempts to safely label it. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… Love, money, divorce, anger, and murder. One Pennsylvania family had it all, and then some in the late 1800s. Count St. Germain or Jacques St. Germain, John and Wayne Carter, the casket girls of New Orleans, despite many years between all of their lives, they all still have one grisly thing in common. All were thought to be, and possibly were, real vampires tied to the Big Easy, a place where real bloodsuckers continue to live and roam the streets even now in the 21st century. But first, they have a long history in the United Kingdom, stalking the moors and fog-carpeted streets in the night. But it appears hounds from hell have also made their way to the Americas. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Hellhounds, in one form or another, have been recorded throughout human history, from a variety of far-flung cultures, and although their appearance varies depending on the area and the local traditions, they are typically described as a very large black hound, which can range anywhere in size from that of a large Great Dane all the way up to the size of a cow or a horse. They're usually described as truly frightening beasts, being totally black, with shaggy or matted fur, and large, saucer-sized eyes that are typically described as burning with a malevolent red, yellow, or green glow, although some accounts say they have only a single luminous eye. Usually they're described as having formidable claws, vicious-looking fangs, and as being supernaturally agile, fast, and strong. The hounds can be reported as either tangible and real, or, conversely, purely spectral creatures, with any attempt to touch them proving to pass through them as if they aren't there. Folklore usually suggests that they have a horrific wail or howl which can invoke sheer terror in those who hear it, and they're known to even have a sinister, human-sounding laugh, but that their footfalls are typically completely silent. The British Isles in particular have long had tales of such entities, 
with countless tales of phantom hounds which prowl the lonely roads, crypts, cemeteries, and wilds here, and stories of these hellhounds go back centuries. The hounds have been known as the Girt Dog, Padfoot, Barguest, the Hairy Hound, the Yeth, and Old Shock, Old Snarly Yell, and Old Scarf, among many others. In Ireland, they're known as Puka. On the Isle of Man, they are Modi Du. In Wales, the Waligi. And in Scotland, the beastly hounds are called Susith. The most popular and widely used term for these bizarre entities in the United Kingdom is the Black Shuck, a term which originated with the name the hounds were given in Norfolk, Suffolk, and Cambridgeshire, with the name deriving from the Old English word skucka, meaning demon, or possibly the word shucky, meaning shaggy or hairy. These frightening creatures were said to be anything from the ghosts of dead travelers to the spirits of dead hounds awaiting the return of their masters, to inscrutable guardians of forbidden knowledge, to being the devil himself. The folklore and sightings of these huge, mysterious hounds go back centuries, inspiring a great amount of literature and spooky history in their path. Yet these creatures are certainly not confined to the old folklore of Britain, and there are many real modern sightings and encounters with apparent hellhounds across the pond in the United States, and these have come up right into the present. True Stories of Hellhounds in the Americas When Weird Darkness Returns Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you or someone you know struggles with depression or dark thoughts, I'd like to recommend the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There I've gathered numerous free resources to help you fight depression, including the Crisis Text Line, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, Save.org, iFred, and more. These resources are absolutely free, and they are there when you need them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. We're talking about hellhounds, and although they are pretty well known on the other side of the pond, on this side of the pond, we still have them. We start at the Appalachian Mountains of the eastern United States, which have seen quite a few reports of what seem to be hellhounds, especially in the states of Kentucky and West Virginia. Reports go back quite some time, with some accounts coming from as early as the late 17th century of great black dogs with glowing eyes terrorizing the region, and such accounts have continued on into more recent times. In Kentucky, there have long been reports of massive black dogs measuring about four feet high at the shoulder and seven feet long, and one of these beasts allegedly prowled the area of Pike County through the 1930s and 40s reportedly massacring cattle and sometimes even humans, as well as frightening locals. In modern times, such reports drew the interest of paranormal and cryptid investigators for the TV show Mountain Monsters, who went to the area for an investigation. The excursion would turn out to be pretty bizarre, if inconclusive. The investigators spoke with farmers in the area who showed them torn-apart carcasses of livestock and gave spooky accounts of something large and dark prowling through the wilderness. They were also shown an alleged video of the beast, as well as paw prints measuring seven and a half to eight inches long, very big for a dog. During the investigation, the team built a bamboo drop cage and baited it with hog shoulders in an effort to lure it out, and although they don't catch it, they can hear something crashing around in the brush, growling and can see a large shadow. It's all very dramatic, and whether the episode has any truth to it or not, Kentucky and other areas of Appalachia have still produced many reports of hellhounds. Also on the East Coast is an account from Connecticut, 
where a witness on the site, Real Unexplained Mysteries, claims to have lived in an apartment that was haunted by shadow people and the apparition of some sort of massive spectral hound. The thing would first appear one night looming over their bed, and she would describe the terrifying experience thus. I woke with an over-by-then boyfriend. It's very immense, stands like a human, has red eyes, long pointy nails. The hands are not like ours, but not paws. It has a very unique snout, more pronounced than a canine. It's no dog, but a beast. I warded it off. I had so much fear, I guess I had nothing to lose, and hovered over my boyfriend almost like a dog. Told myself, show no fear, and I can't even explain the immense anger I felt. It does not speak like us, but more in mind. Almost perception. I growled like in my mind and remember thinking, stay away. That's when the anger swept over me. It backed up and vanished in the wall. I wish I could say it was a happy ending, but wasn't. I started having night terrors, always ending in my death, every night. This report fits in well with the lore of hellhounds being spectral entities rather than physical ones, and also matches some of the stories of them feeding off of fear. What did she see? We'll likely never know. Moving up to Michigan, we also have reports of outsized canine monstrosities, and one report posted in Jason Offutt's blog, From the Shadows, comes from the area of Romulus, Michigan. The witness, known as S. Costea, claimed that he'd been living with his family at a cabin on a farm there at the time, which was all surrounded by thick woods that was the home of something rather unusual, to say the least. According to Costea, there was some sort of dog creature about the size of a Great Dane and with glowing red eyes. It skulked about in the darkness there in the evening hours, and he would say of it, We had this really strange dog creature that would hang around the property. I say dog creature because this thing was far too big and intelligent to be a stray dog. It had very pronounced red eyes. I'm not saying it was a werewolf or a dogman, but it was very werewolf-like. The dog would frequently stalk the edge of the woods on our property in the day. It seemed to have no fear. My uncle would yell at it or throw things towards it to try and scare it off. It would simply rear up on its hind legs like a ram and charge at him for a short distance. We would frequently find dead chickens or rabbits after thunderstorms. We knew it was that dog thing because it would leave huge paw prints in the mud and claw marks on the window ledges. Sometimes we would find the screens ripped from our screen doors and windows. It would never outright attack us, but it did seem to enjoy taunting us and harassing us. This was all frightening enough, but it got even weirder when it demonstrated an ability to walk about on two feet for short durations, and even more bizarrely, began to speak, seeming to call people outside for some insidious purpose. Costea claims that his mother found him one night, sitting by the window talking to the creature, and would describe the surreal scene thus. One summer night, my mom had left the window open in my bedroom to cool the room off so I could sleep. She was on her way to the bathroom and went by my room and heard me talking to someone. When she opened the door, she saw me standing in my bed and I had apparently wet my pajamas. I was talking towards the window. I wasn't screaming or freaking out, but seemed to be transfixed and talking in a low voice towards the window. When she looked towards the window, the dog had its two front paws pushed through the screen and was looking through the window at us and making a low growl. Its eyes glared red. I always recall its eyes. You could see its eyes out in the woods sometimes at night. I have bad dreams about it from time to time. The boy's mother then threw a beer bottle at the thing to chase it off, but for the next few weeks, Costea allegedly displayed odd behavior and the house pets would not go near him. He would also blurt out cryptic messages such as, We don't want you here, our ghosts are food, or God thinks you're bad, and would sometimes intentionally prick himself with sharp objects until he drew blood. It almost seemed as if the thing at the window had crawled into his head somehow and that this was a kind of, like, demonic possession to an extent. The frightening ordeal would finally come to an end when his uncle hit it with a rifle, and Costea would say of this, 
My uncle was out back working on his truck when he saw the dog at the edge of the woods making its way toward the rabbit pen. At this point, he was tired of dealing with it and went into the house to get his 22. Apparently, he fired at it and hit it in the rear. The dog turned and ran into the woods. We didn't see it anymore after that, and everything cleared up. Also from Michigan is a report from the unlikely locale of Detroit, where a witness living in one of the city's suburbs claims he had an encounter with a hellhound in 2012. He claims that one evening he was driving through his neighborhood after leaving his girlfriend's house at around midnight when he saw some streak of movement coming from someone's backyard, and he described it as being a very large and well-built creature. He immediately stopped his car in order to get a view of the thing and was first impressed with how incredibly fast it moved for its size, estimated as around 40 to 50 miles per hour. He observed it for a moment before it streaked out of view and would describe it thus. The creature was very large. If I had to compare the size to another animal, I'd say it was about the size of an adult lion. The body type appeared to be that of a dog, although I've never seen any breed of dog this size and there are absolutely no wild or stray dogs in the area. It had a pitch black coat, and while I could slightly make out the shape of its head from the side, I never saw its eyes or mouth. When it ran past my headlights initially, it never acknowledged my presence. It did not turn and look at me, slow down, or do anything that was directed toward me. I feel confident that if this was a hellhound, it was not looking for me, but I don't know that for sure. In nearby Wisconsin, we have reports emanating from a place called Meridian Island on the Chippewa River, which according to a few witness accounts, seems to be prowled by some sort of canine beast. One report comes from a young couple by the names of Shelley Touchstone and Chris Weiner, who were at the island's boat landing looking for a secluded spot, when a thick fog or mist began to form out of nowhere, and which seemed to instill an inexplicable dread in them. They then heard something moving about and growling in a menacing fashion just out of the periphery of their vision, as well as a large shadow as big as a bear with two pinpoints of glowing red eyes. On another occasion, two men named Mike Bagazzi and Jeremy Stark were in the very same area when they too felt a sudden onset of dread and witnessed a fog congeal out of nowhere. They then apparently spotted a large black hound with matted, filthy hair which gave chase as they ran away. They only apparently managed to evade it when they got to their car and locked the doors, after which it meandered off into the wilderness and vanished. These cases hit a couple of interesting points in that hellhounds are supposedly fond of areas near water, and also that many supernatural phenomena seem to involve a fog or mist, although whatever this connection may be is misunderstood. Going down south, we have a case from the state of Louisiana in a report published by the National Cryptid Society. The report comes from the area of Robilene, Louisiana in 1995 and concerns a witness who claims he was in a graveyard looking for paranormal phenomena, the two of them armed with crosses and an M16, which seems a bit extreme, but here we are. As they pushed forward into the cemetery, they allegedly heard strange growling noises and the witness describes what happened next. We shined our flashlights all over the graveyard. It was small and enclosed by a fence. I said it must be a dog tied over at the parsonage. The church and parsonage was about 500 feet away. So I shined around and over in the corner of the graveyard, I saw four fresh graves. They were apart from the other graves. They had no flowers, just two big graves and two small ones marked by four iron crosses. As he went to explore, we heard the growling grow louder. I said, Lanny, is that dog loose? I kind of felt a little safe, knowing it'd be hard for it to jump the fence. But as we got closer to the grave, the hair on my neck stood up and I got chills. My friend got the same feeling. The growls had a sound like Rottweilers. They chilled you to the bone and you felt something wasn't right. We heard the snarling as we got a few feet from the grave. The growls were not part of a body they were disembodied. Then I tried to rationalize it in my head. Is it a couple loose, mean dogs outside the gate? Is it a group of coyotes? But as we shine the light this time, we saw them. 
We'll find out exactly what they did see when Weird Darkness returns. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. You can get more Weird Darkness seven days a week through the Weird Darkness podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to podcasts, on YouTube, or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash listen, and you can find a list of all the apps where you can listen to the show. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash listen. When we left our story, a couple of witnesses from the National Cryptid Society were investigating a haunted graveyard, or what they thought might have been one. But then they started hearing some snarling just a few feet from a grave. But as we shine the light this time, we saw them. Two sets of glowing red eyes not attached to a body. They were only three feet away and stood guard by those graves. My friend froze in fright and pushed me in front. He was crying about leaving his gun. I said, Lanny, your gun won't help against this. The dogs were vicious, and I said, Lanny, whatever you do, don't run. I prayed for guidance. I would not been to church in many a year, but I knew what I was dealing with was straight from hell. I looked right at them. I showed my cross and said that I know what you are. They snarled louder. My friend was really upset and wanting his mama. I said, Lanny, please. I said, I demand in the name of Jesus Christ that you allow us to leave as we came in peace and alone. I demand this in the name of the Son of Man and victor over all that is evil. I said that the Son of Man ruled over all evil and I demand you let us leave in peace. We slowly backed up and as we got to the gate, we left. This particular report seems to go overboard a bit, but who knows. All the way over on the other side of the country, we come to California which has a few accounts of hellhounds of its own. From American Canyon, California comes an account from a 28-year-old witness known as Jedediah who claims that one night, as he was walking back from a market, he heard an ear-piercing howl echo out into the night. He soon caught sight of a very large dog, which he at first took to be a stray or someone's pet, but which seemed to be too large to be such a thing. As he looked more closely, he saw that it seemed to have glowing red eyes and be entangled with what looked to be barbed wire. He would say of what happened next, At this point, I was quite scared. I continued on my way home and I found myself dreading each corner, fearing another sighting of this hellish creature. I'd almost made it home when the beast appeared again. This time it stood directly in my path. I was frozen with fear, hair standing up on end and I closed my eyes fearing an attack. It starts to growl, a deep, rumbling growl, one that I felt deep in my soul, one that threatens to turn my legs to jello. I don't know what compelled me to do so, but I started praying to the Lord and Jesus Christ in heaven to make this beast leave, but the growling intensified. It seemed as if the growl just pulsated through my mind, doing everything in its power to get me to stop praying. I continued to pray. I just prayed and prayed and prayed. As I continued to pray, the growl slowly dissipated. When I finally opened my eyes, all that was left was scorch marks where the dog stood. To this day, I have yet to see the same dog, or another like it, so this begs the question, what did I see? A hellhound? A spectral creature? Some sort of demon? I never will know, but then again, I'm not sure I want to. Also in California, is a case that made the rounds involving what seems like a pack of hellhounds in Palm Springs, California. In 2013, there were supposedly numerous reports of large black hounds running amok in the streets, with glowing eyes and sharp fangs. The creatures were described as having the bodies of dogs but the heads of wolves, and baffled all who saw them. Apparently, they tore through people's yards and even attacked a man's car to rip up his bumper before disappearing into the night to vanish. There was very little to corroborate this, but it is a strange case indeed. 
such creatures surely seem to toe the line between the real and fantasy, where we're not really sure what we should be looking at. What are hellhounds? How can they possibly be? Are these some sort of demonic entity, wandering spirit, or what? Are they misidentifications of large dogs or some wildlife? These reports seem to be beyond explanation and show that these old legends from across the world have seemed to seep into the realm of the real. Whatever they are, hellhounds have been spotted all over the world, and the United States is no exception. When Weird Darkness returns, love, money, divorce, anger, murder, one Pennsylvania family had it all and then some in the late 1800s. Plus, we'll make our way to New Orleans, a city full of vampires, past and present. These stories are up next. Christina Hasler, 50 years old, grew quite wealthy from several oil wells operating on her farm in Butler County, Pennsylvania, but she was not so fortunate in her personal life. She married a man named Nordheim and had four children by him. They lived together until, for some unspecified reason, Nordheim made a murderous assault against Christina's father. He was sent to the penitentiary, and Christina secured a divorce and resumed her maiden name. In 1878, one of Christina's three daughters married a man named Harper Whitmere. They borrowed money from Christina, giving her a mortgage on the property. Whitmere later induced her to cancel the mortgage and put the farm in his wife's name and consider it her full share in her mother's estate. But Whitmere had already borrowed money on the farm, representing himself as the owner. When the loan came due, he had to continue borrowing money to stay out of trouble. Mrs. Whitmere died under suspicious circumstances in 1891. Though he was never arrested, many believed that Harper Whitmere had beaten her to death. Whitmere put the children in the care of a charitable school and left Butler County. Whitmere returned in early December 1893 and went to see Christina Hassler, presumably to ask for money. She let him stay in the farmhouse. Also staying at the house were Christina's daughter Flora, who had recently married James Martin, and her son, Louis Nordheim, who worked on the oil wells. Louis had been working the night of December 4th, and when he returned home at 9 o'clock the following morning, he found the house in disarray. Trunks had been opened, boxes and drawers had been ransacked. In an adjoining room, he found his mother lying in agony, barely breathing. She'd been struck in the forehead by the broad blade of a hatchet. Nearby, Flora lay dead, her throat cut from ear to ear. Christina remained alive just long enough to tell her son that Harper Whitmere had committed the murders. Sheriff Campbell began the search for the killer, and at the house of his brother, Samuel Whitmere, he learned that Harper had been there and asked to borrow his revolver. When Samuel asked why he wanted it, Harper said, I've killed two women and I want to make an end of myself. Samuel refused to give him the revolver, and Harper went away. Samuel contacted his other brothers, Louis, Daniel, and Peter. Peter went to town to get a warrant, and the other three went looking for Harper. They found him sitting by a fire outside the home of John Calvin. As the brothers tried to convince Harper to return to Samuel's for dinner, they saw two rigs coming toward the house. Harper said that he would not be taken alive. He ran to the barn, found his son Sid, and gave him some money. Then he went around a hill to a small grass plot and before anyone reached him, he sat down and cut his throat, hacking it six times with the same razor he used on Flora Martin. He was dead by the time his brother got him back to Samuel's house. Public sentiment against Harper Whitmere had been strong, but as reported in the History of Butler County, Pennsylvania, 
Whitmere relieved the county of the onus and cost of the prosecution. New Orleans is an eerie place. It's gothic in one sense and dangerous in another. The city has a rich and colorful history and is the perfect place for scouting out the supernatural. New Orleans boasts a whole host of vampire, cemetery, voodoo, and ghost tours which often last as long as two hours. It is known as one of the most haunted cities in America. Vampire legends are an important part of New Orleans history. Stories stretch back to France in the illustrious 1700s when there was a mysterious man who charmed the courts of Europe. The Comte de Saint-Germain was a very strange, extraordinary, and enigmatic character. He was a master of the piano and the violin, could converse in six different languages, and his skills as a conversationalist were unrivaled, a skill that is nowadays a lost art. He also composed music, including arias and solo work for violin. His wealth was unfathomable. He carried gems around in his clothing and no one knew how he came into such wealth. No one knew anything about his family, where he came from, or who he was. He did, according to some accounts, claim to be a son of Francis II Rakowski, Prince of Transylvania. One of his greatest passions was alchemy and he was believed to have an extraordinary talent for maintaining his youth. Perhaps it was his vast knowledge of cosmetics and herbs that kept him young. The philosopher Voltaire called him the man who knows everything and who never dies. No one really knew his true age. He looked about 40 in all of his portraits and continued to appear so for over half a century. Although he was charming, engaging, and graced the dinner tables of many dukes and kings, no one had ever seen him eat anything. He would only sip his wine, exquisitely, and ramble on about everything from history to chemistry. There was much speculation about the Count's lineage and immense wealth, which resulted in the development of many myths and legends about his background. He's considered by some to have mastered immortality, as many have claimed to have seen him since his death in 1784. Fast forward to New Orleans, Louisiana, and there appears a man by the name of Jacques St. Germain in the early 20th century. He fits every description of the Comte. Around 40 years of age, with heavy money bags, the most fascinating of dinner guests, and still a complete mystery. He would throw lavish parties and invite the elite, and everyone would sit enraptured in the conversation and food. But curiously enough, this Jacques would never eat a morsel, only sip his wine. One night, several months after moving to New Orleans, he had a lady stay a bit late. Out on his balcony at the corner of Ursuline and Royal Streets, this St. Germain grabbed her and tried to bite her neck. She escaped by falling from the balcony and then reported the incident to the police. When the police came to investigate, Jacques St. Germain had vanished. They searched his apartment and found tablecloths with large splotches of blood on them. They searched the kitchen, where they found no sign of food or evidence that food had ever been there. All they found were bottles of wine, and after pouring themselves a glass, drinking it, and then spitting it out, they discovered that it was not only wine in those bottles. It was wine mixed with human blood. It is unclear whether the Count St. Germain and Jacques are the same person but believers speculate that they are. To this day, the mysterious figure of the Count St. Germain has his own occult following, from theosophists to complete way out their mystics. Although he allegedly died in the year 1784, no one saw his death, and some claim to have seen him many years afterward. Nevertheless, he disappeared from court life. I would too if I knew that the French Revolution was coming, which some people claim he had foreseen. In terms of murder rates, New Orleans ranks among the highest. It's always been a notorious place for missing persons. That is, it is a place where people just disappear and no one ever knows what happened to them. The blood of the French, Spanish, 
Indian, African, Creole, and English all mixed together here, where the mosquito is not so picky. Nor perhaps are other creatures. Jean and Wayne Carter were brothers. They seemed to be normal in every aspect. They both had normal labor jobs down by the river and lived in the French Quarter. It was the 1930s, during the Great Depression, and times were hard, so a man worked all he could. One day, a girl was reported to have escaped from the Carter brothers' apartment and run to the authorities. Her wrists were cut, not enough to cause immediate death, but enough to cause her blood to drain slowly over the next several days. The policemen ran to the Carter's third-story apartment and found four other people tied to chairs with their wrists sliced in the same fashion. Some had been there for many days. The story was that the brothers had abducted these people in order to drink their blood at the end of every day when they came home from work. Police also found about 14 dead bodies. The cops waited for the brothers to return, and when they did, it took seven or eight of them to hold down the two average-sized men. A few years later, when the Carters were finally executed, their bodies were placed in a New Orleans vault. Cemeteries in New Orleans are quite picturesque. Not only are they more ornate than the rest of the nations, but they inter many generations of one family inside one vault. The remains sift down into the bottom of the vault, and when it's all rubble, a new body is slid inside. Many years after the Carter brothers' deaths, when they were placing another Carter in the family vault, they discovered the vault was completely empty. No John or Wayne. They were gone. To this day, many sightings have occurred in the French Quarter that match the description of these two brothers almost exactly. Years later, an owner of their apartment saw two figures that matched their descriptions outside on the balcony, whispering to each other. Both figures jumped off the top of the third-story balcony and took off running. The legend goes that if a vampire drinks your blood seven nights in a row, then and only then can you become a vampire. Some of those found in the Carter brothers' apartment had been there for more than seven days. One warped fellow named Philippe went on to become a notorious serial killer. And of course, he would do more than just kill his victims. He was believed to drink the blood of all 32 of his victims. During the colonization of New Orleans, France was having a hard time convincing women to make the voyage. This was mostly due to the fact that the men originally sent were thieves, murderers and culprits of every type and caste, not to mention Louisiana's snakes, alligators, mosquitoes, and humidity. Eventually, some women were sent. Some sources say they were nuns, while others say they were prostitutes. But nevertheless, a few of them made it. Many of them snuck off the ship in Mobile, Alabama when they ported there, and were told what type of riffraff they would be tricked into marrying if they stayed on board. Historically, these women were referred to as casket girls, in reference to these small chests in which they carried their clothing and other belongings. However, the legend goes that these girls had the most interesting luggage, shaped like coffins. So to the dismay of the men of New Orleans, all that arrived in New Orleans were 300 of these coffin-like suitcases. Some stories say they were empty. Some say they contained the undead. These suitcases were reportedly stored in the attic of a convent in the French Quarter where they still sit behind windows that are nailed shut because they have a strange habit of just opening by themselves. Years later, in 1978, two amateur reporters demanded that the convent's priest let them in to see the coffins. The priest, of course, denied their entrance, so one night these two men climbed over a wall with their recording equipment and set up their workstation. The next morning, the reporter's equipment was found strewn about on the street outside, and there on the convent's front steps were found the almost decapitated bodies of these two men. Eighty percent of their blood was gone. To this day, this unsolved crime baffles investigators. However, research indicates that these legends are completely unsupported by historical evidence. It's unclear how or when the myth of the casket girls began but the story continues to haunt tourists and believers to this day. Clinical vampirism has been recognized as a neurological disease in which those with symptoms drink human blood, 
believing it to be beneficial for their health. Psychologists have said that symptoms begin with incidences in childhood that draw a sexual connection to the ingestion of blood. This interest in blood results in the individual drinking their own blood, and eventually that of other humans or animals. John Edgar Browning, a Ph.D. candidate at Louisiana State University, conducted research in New Orleans that determined that there were about 50 individuals who identified as vampires living in New Orleans alone. Many of the real vampires of New Orleans have fangs or are nocturnal. Research has indicated that these markers are cultural, but the vampires insist they are biological. Another study by the Atlanta Vampire Alliance reported about 5,000 of these individuals in the United States. However, clinical vampirism, also sometimes called Renfield's syndrome, has not been recognized by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Those who self-identify as vampires even have their own organization in New Orleans, known as the New Orleans Vampire Association, or NOVA. The organization accepts all paradigms or denominations of sorts of those who identify as vampires. NOVA is governed by a council which is comprised of members of seven houses that serve as sects of denominations, reflecting various aspects of NOVA's community values. Browning's research involved extensive time spent at NOVA meetings, from which he observed that the members were predominantly Caucasian. There were nearly equal numbers of men and women, and the members were between the ages of 18 and 50. The association was formed in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans. Members participate in charitable events, such as serving food to the homeless and hosting silent auctions. However, their website is not currently maintained, and it's unclear whether they are still in operation. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do, and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show, plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com. You can also follow me on social media. Drop me an email. Send me your own true paranormal story. Listen to other podcasts that I host and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I have already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. American Hellhounds is by Brent Swanser for Mysterious Universe. The Butler County Tragedy is by Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. And Vampires of New Orleans is by Brian Harrison for Exemplor. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 1 verse 19. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And a final thought. I began learning long ago that those who are happiest are those who do the most for others. Booker T. Washington I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. You might think of werewolf stories as something only told for fun around the campfire, but that hasn't always been the case. Historically, many slayings, crimes, and generally horrific incidents have been attributed to werewolves. People truly believed in the existence of these creatures. In fact, in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, werewolf trials accompanied witch trials, and sometimes they were even one and the same. It's even more surprising to note the number of people who confessed to being werewolves or lycanthropes. Some were likely tortured into confession, but others believed themselves to be real werewolves. 
The idea that someone could transform into an animal was a popular one, and people thought they could make a deal with the devil in order to obtain that power. Is there any truth behind the enduring legend of the werewolf? Or were these creatures just convenient scapegoats for mysterious misdeeds? Whatever you think, there's no denying that these historical encounters with werewolves are fascinating and downright spooky. Keep listening if you dare. But be warned, these real-life werewolf stories might have you worried about the next full moon. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… On a barren field in the U.S. state of Georgia, five granite slabs rise in a star pattern. Each of them weighs over 20 tons, and on top of them there's a capstone. Nobody knows who built it or why they were placed there, but one popular opinion is that their purpose is to guide humanity after a predicted post-apocalyptic event that will come in the not-so-distant future. When you think fairies, what comes to mind? You probably picture an adorable and sparkly creature akin to Disney's Tinkerbell, a lovely and, above all, friendly presence. You may even want to make contact with them. Unfortunately, glittering humanoids with butterfly wings are the stuff of children's books. Retrace fairy folklore and you'll discover their secret, scary origins. In the summer of 1949, a geologist discovered a strange feature on the surface of the Earth in southeastern Siberia. Encircled by a largely treed area, this anomaly is oval with a conical crater that contains a small, ball-like mound in its middle. The geological mystery has baffled scientists who are uncertain of what has caused this weird formation. But first, is there any truth behind the enduring legend of the werewolf? We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of our Weirdo family, Please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. In the 1500s, a French tailor was convicted of luring in, torturing, and slaying his victims before cooking and eating them for supper. He was also accused of turning into a werewolf to terrorize the town by night. Although there was no exact victim count, he was believed to have slain dozens. As the story goes, the tailor made no attempt to defend himself. Instead, he cursed until his last breath when he was burned at the stake. The court was apparently so shocked by his evil acts that the court documents were burned as well. Peter Stubb was one of many self-confessed werewolves. In 1589, he claimed that his wolfskin belt allowed him to transform, and he also said he had slain over a dozen victims. As one story went, the devil transformed him into the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled like unto brands of fire, a mouth great and wide with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. Stubb's tale should be taken with a large grain of salt. He confessed after prolonged torture. 
he was ultimately decapitated on Halloween 1589, and his body was burned at the stake. In 1685, the people of Ansbach were angry and scared as their livestock was attacked by a wolf, and that was before it started taking lives. The locals were convinced it was their deceased mayor back to torment them by returning in wolf form. The townspeople eventually slew the wolf. They then dressed it as the mayor and put the carcass on display before moving it to a local museum. Estonia held a number of werewolf trials in the 17th century, including that of Hans the werewolf. Many accused werewolves claimed to have made a deal with the devil to gain their shape-shifting powers but 18-year-old Hans said that a man in black had bitten him. He confessed that he had hunted as a werewolf for the past two years. Although Hans didn't claim to have made an actual pact with the devil, the court still considered him guilty of sorcery and sentenced him to be executed. The French seemed to be obsessed with werewolves, and one of their most famous cases was the werewolf of Dole. Giles Garnier was a hermit who lived out on the outskirts of his town with his wife, When children in the town started to go missing and turned up mutilated, the townspeople set off on a wolf hunt. They eventually decided Garnier was to blame. He confessed to being given an ointment by a demon that allowed him to turn into a wolf and said that he had slain and eaten at least four children. He was burned at the stake. A mutilated boy was found in the French woods in 1598, with the unfortunate Jacques Roulet discovered nearby. Roulet, hurt and disrobed, was detained and confessed to the murder of the boy and others before him. Roulet claimed he had an ointment that could transform him into a wolf. Unlike many cases of lycanthropy, he wasn't executed. On an appeal, he was proclaimed insane and put in an asylum. With a long trail of gore behind them, Pierre Burgot and Michael Verdun confessed to being werewolves in 1521. Their deeds were gruesome, as records indicate. They killed a woman who was gathering peas, also seized a little girl of four years old and ate the palpitation flesh, all save one arm. Other persons were murdered by them in this way, for they loved to lap up the warm, flowing blood. One chilling American werewolf legend comes from the state of Georgia. As the story goes, the widowed Mildred Burt lived in a rural part of the country in the mid-19th century. One of her daughters, Emily Isabella Burt, had trouble sleeping at night, and she had extra hair and sharp teeth. When a local man, William Gorman, told the Burts that someone had been killing his sheep, Mrs. Burt feared that Emily had something to do with the attacks. When Mrs. Burt went out to investigate one night, an animal lunged at her. Mrs. Burt fired at it, but the animal escaped. The next day, Emily was missing her left hand. She was sent away to Paris to be treated for lycanthropy and the attacks stopped. She passed away in 1911. Vazeslav was the very real ruler of Politsk in what's now known as Belarus. Known as Vazeslav the Sorcerer for his rumored magical prowess, he was also believed to take the form of a wolf. He passed in 1101, but the legend didn't stop there. In fact, even a 2005 commemorative coin in Belarus showed a wolf behind Vazeslav's portrait. The tale of the Beast of Gavodin is one surrounded by mystery and a whole lot of bloodshed. Between 1764 and 1767, the French province of Gavodin suffered a series of attacks and slayings in which the throats of victims were ripped out. Theories abounded as to who or what was responsible, but most believed it to be a giant wolf. Locals fired at the beast and attempted to poison it, with no noticeable effects. It vanished in 1767, and its fate remains unknown. And finally, beliefs differ on what exactly turned someone into a werewolf. In ancient Greece, apparently people believed that someone could be transformed by eating the meat of a wolf and a human mixed together. This story is similar to the tale of King Lycon. He attempted to trick the god Zeus into eating human flesh. Zeus wasn't pleased and turned the king into a wolf as punishment. His name is likely the root of the word lycanthropy. When Weird Darkness returns, on a barren field in the U.S. state of Georgia, 
five granite slabs rose in a star pattern. Each of them weighed over 20 tons, and on top of them there was a capstone. Nobody knows who built it or why they were placed there, but one popular opinion was that their purpose was to guide humanity after a predicted post-apocalyptic event that would come in the not-so-distant future. We'll look at America's Stonehenge, up next. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you'd like to stay up to date on everything that we do with the show, both on the show and also online, you can subscribe to the Weird Darkness newsletter. It's, of course, free, and you can sign up for it at WeirdDarkness.com slash newsletter. On a barren field in the state of Georgia, five granite slabs rise in a star pattern. Each of them weighs over 20 tons, and on top of them there's a capstone. Nobody knows who built it or why they were placed there, but one popular opinion is that their purpose is to guide humanity after a predicted post-apocalyptic event that will come in the not-so-distant future. The huge blocks sent a message out to the world in eight different current languages, as well as four extinct ones – ancient Greek and Egyptian hieroglyphs, for example. The set of ten guidelines has baffled people around the world, with descriptions ranging from perfect and utopian to satanic or quirky. But no matter what the case, these ten commandments should definitely get you thinking. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. 3. Unite humanity with a living new language. 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. 5. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. 6. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. 7 avoid petty laws and useless officials. 8. Balance personal rights with social duties. 9. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. And 10. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. While some of them are clearly noble and laudable, like having fair laws and avoiding petty ones, some of them have stirred controversy, especially maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature, and guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. If we were to apply these laws now, we'd have to kill over 90% of the planet. However, this is a perfect example of a misinterpretation because it has to be kept in mind that these commandments have to be applied after the alleged apocalyptic event. It's not clear why they settled on 500 million, but the bottom line is that many believe the world to be overpopulated right now. We're indeed finding better and better ways to manage our resources and use sustainable or renewable forces, but in just the last 50 years, the population of the Earth has more than doubled, and if we were to keep that up, the prognosis could be dire indeed. But back to our Georgia stones. Whoever built them definitely knew what they were doing. The slabs stand proud and sturdy and will endure through the centuries with minimal damage. They also have a remarkable set of other features. For example, they feature a built-in channel that indicates the celestial pole, a horizontal slot that shows the annual travel of the sun, as well as a system that marks noontime throughout the year. But why they have these features and lack others that would apparently be more useful for dazed survivors is still a mystery. It all started on a Friday in June 1979. An elegantly dressed gray-haired man showed up in Elbert County and introduced himself as R.C. Christian, 
a reference to Christian Rosencruz, or Christian Rose Cross in English, and said he represents a small group of loyal Americans. Rosencruz is a legendary character that founded the Order of the Rose Cross. He quickly became one of the most important and mysterious figures of the time by blending Christianity with some teachings of Arab and Persian sages. R.C. Christian admitted this is not his real name, but refused to reveal anything about his identity. Joe Fenley, president of the company that specializes in granite construction, didn't care too much about this. That is, until he found out what monument R.C. Christian had in mind. He explained that it would be a compass, calendar, and clock, and also be engraved with a set of guides written in eight of the world's languages. Fenley believed he was dealing with a crazy man and wanted to get rid of him, so he explained that a large number of tools and machines would be required. But Christian just nodded. He then quoted a price several times greater than the real one. But again, Christian seemed indifferent. So, Fenley sent him to Wyatt Martin, president of the Granite City Bank. Martin is probably one of the people who have seen and spoken to the mystery man the most. The astrological specifications were incredibly complex, so the construction company had to employ the help of an astronomer from the University of Georgia. The complex indicates the day of the year, equinoxes and solstices among others, but the main feature is the ten guides engraved in the several languages. The mission statement raises the first few question marks, let these be guidestones to an age of reason. But controversy started even before the monument was finished, many claiming it to be the devil's work. By 1980, when they started building the monument, Martin remembers that people started telling him to stop and accused him of being part of an occult movement. The main problem is that the commandments engraved on the stones are quite eccentric, to say the least. It didn't take a lot to compare the first two commandments to the practices of Nazis, among others. But again, this doesn't mean that a large part of mankind has to disappear. The guides apply in a post-apocalyptic event, where the population is undoubtedly very small. This can be very hard to digest, but seeing things from their point of view is quite interesting, and any comparison with the Nazis or far-right ideology is unreasonable. I mean, if a horrendous tragedy happens, and somehow the world population is reduced to just a few hundred million, then Yes, it'd be a good idea to have some care regarding the number of humans. Guide number three instructed people to use a common language, which would of course greatly reduce numerous difficulties throughout today's world. Achieving such a task is, however, impossible at the moment due to evident practical reasons. This is the part that bothered and annoyed the Christians who quoted the Bible saying that a common tongue is the mark of the Antichrist. Yeah, makes a lot of sense for me too. Same thing with the rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. For some, faith has to be the alpha and omega with nothing else in between. For others, yours truly included, finding a sustainable balance is a much nobler goal. The structure, sometimes referred to as an American Stonehenge, sure stirred a lot of controversies, but it got us to thinking, which means that at least a part of its objective was achieved even ignoring the more controversial commandments, the final six should definitely be worth achieving. After all, what's wrong with avoiding unnecessary officials and prizing truth? Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite, and be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. There's a really powerful vibe in here. Of course, now the Georgia Guidestones are no more. They were destroyed by a bombing in 2022. Does this affect their power and influence over people? Not as much as you might think. After all, we are still talking about it. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you'd like to display your dark weirdness wherever you go, you can find Weird Darkness t-shirts, trucker caps and dad hats, school supplies, kids' clothes, 
coffee mugs, and more in the Weird Darkness store, with dozens of designs to choose from and a variety of colors to match your style. Grab some weirdo merchandise for yourself or maybe as a gift for the weirdo in your life by clicking on store at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash store. When you think fairies, what comes to mind? You probably picture an adorable and sparkly creature akin to Disney's Tinkerbell, a lovely and, above all, friendly presence. You may even want to make contact with them. Unfortunately, glittering humanoids with butterfly wings are the stuff of children's books. Retrace fairy folklore and you'll discover their secret, scary origins. Cultures all over the world put their own disturbing spin on the fairy folk. In Wales, fairy folk take away babies and leave their own twisted offspring in their place. Scottish Kelpies, meanwhile, are known for their taste for human flesh. As for Icelandic Huldafolk and Filipino Berberoka, you'll have to keep listening to discover just what makes them so chilling. Just because they're mythological doesn't mean that fairies are any less frightening. Here are a few of their darkest attributes. Just remember to shut your windows tight before going to sleep tonight. The Banshee, also known as Woman Fairy, originated in Ireland and is said to be most active at night before a passing. In some folklore, she even comes to the door of those who are expected to pass. She looks like a full-sized human female, and though her appearance varies by region, her hair is always stringy and she always wears a white gown or shroud. She frequently appears covered in moss as well. The Banshee's recognized by her loud, mourning wails, which are said to be a harbinger of someone's demise. Bean Fion fairies are also known as drowning fairies. They're said to pull children to their underwater doom. If you're searching for a Bean Fion fairy, you're advised to look around dark waters where drownings have occurred. These creatures were likely devised by parents looking to keep their kids from playing in the water but that doesn't make them any less creepy. Utbirds are fairies that are believed to be the revived spirits of babies who passed during harsh winters. They tend to haunt anyone who hangs around the sites of their demise. Misery is their mission. Utbirds are even known to transform into large and terrifying owls that prey on night travelers. Varikas gather outside the homes of dying people while happily chatting to each other, these 18-inch tall harbingers of doom are instantly recognizable thanks to their vivid red color and blood-stained teeth. According to folklore, they can be appeased, but it isn't easy. Varikas require a shrine filled with daily burned offerings of flowers and spices to leave you alone. Fairies aren't just menaces to humans. They can be a threat to their own kind, too. Consider Kelpies, a kind of human-eating fae. Small, ugly, and bulbous, Kelpies are known for their foul tempers. They were once said to crop up everywhere in Scottish lochs and the North Sea, but fell into decline thanks to their appetite for other fairies. But Kelpies don't discriminate when it comes to slaying. They love to eat deer that wander too near to the lochs, and they're able to shapeshift to lure in human prey. There are even folk tales about Kelpies who take the appearance of seahorses luring young maidens who they then submerge and devour. According to Irish folklore, the sloth are fairies thought to be the souls of evil people. These fairies travel in a swarm at night, often appearing like black birds. Their preferred prey are dying people who have yet to be given their last rites. Some stories, however, say that you can call them by feeling deep sadness or simply by saying their name. Once the sloth have you in their sights, the only way to be rid of them is to offer another person in your place. But they're easy to spot. In their humanoid form, the sloth look like malnourished people with leathery wings. According to Filipino folklore, Berberoka are highly dangerous fairies that inhabit rivers and swamps. They're said to prey upon fishermen by ingesting large volumes of water, thereby bringing up fish. 
Once the fishers make their way to that specific spot, the Baraboka regurgitates the water to capsize their boats. Ultimately, the helpless fishers are dragged underwater and eaten. Bendith, a clan of Welsh fairies, are notorious baby nappers. They nab human babies and replace them with their own deformed offspring known as crimbles. Sometimes the Bendith will return the baby after teaching it about music, but more often than not, parents require the assistance of a witch to get their child back. When they're not taking children, the Bendith get their kicks riding horses and tangling up their manes. Mischievous will-o'-the-wisps haunt marshy ground and love playing practical jokes. However, their jokes consist of leading travelers astray with their flickering lights, sometimes leading people straight to their doom in the bogs. It's believed that steering clear of the will-o'-the-wisp footpaths is the best way to avoid them, although they are known to sometimes help people who are kind to them and offer them money. A threatening but solitary creature, the Feichan Fairy, lives in the Highland Mountains. The Feichan's brooding nature is due to its appearance, as it has only one of everything – one ear, one arm, one leg, one toe, and one eye. All of these features are centered directly down the middle of its body, which is both hairy and feathery. These creatures are said to be so hideous that the mere sight of them can stop a person's heart. The Feichan is sensitive about not having wings or the gift of flight, so it waves a spiked club at all living things that cross its path. The blue men of the Minch, or Sea Kelpies, prey on sailors. They sport green beards and hair and are pretty buff. Some say that these creatures live in caves underwater and that they can control the weather and the seas. If you ever plan on sailing the high seas, make sure you have what it takes to defeat the Sea Kelpies. According to folklore, captains have escaped disaster on the water simply with their sharp tongues. However, the blue men of the Minch can only be beaten in rhyming duels. Huldefolk are Icelandic fairies that are somewhat neutral. Some people believe them to be beneficial, and they build tiny wooden homes for the fairies to live in. Huldefolk aren't typically malicious, but they do have a strict moral code. These human-like creatures are known to attempt to seduce people. Those who resist are rewarded, while anyone who surrenders is punished. I actually went more in depth regarding the Holdefolk or Iceland elves in a previous episode. I'll place a link to it in the show notes. The Kalakantzeroi fairies are always without clothes. While that might make you uncomfortable, the creep factor comes with their feet. They're usually shaped like those of different animals. Kalakantzeroi fairies tend to ride around on chickens and are blind, so they're typically found in groups. Sometimes they even recruit outcast fairies to be their guides. And finally, brownies. They're typically garden fairies who do chores and help around the house. While that might sound sweet and endearing, folklore says that they are hideous to look at. In some regions of Scotland, brownies have no separated toes or fingers. In other areas, they have a hole in their face where their nose should be. When Weird Darkness returns, in the summer of 1949, a geologist discovered a strange feature on the surface of the Earth in southeastern Siberia. Encircled by a largely treed area, this anomaly is oval with a conical crater that contains a small ball-like mound in its middle. The geological mystery has baffled scientists who are uncertain of what caused this weird formation. That story and more on the way. Jersey Beth sent in Gertie's red pen. Here's her story. When I visited Gertie for lunch at the nursing home, she told me she was ready to die. What do you think happens when we die? I asked. She scoffed. Nothing, she said with a dismissive wave. Lights out. 
It was this kind of incisive brevity I loved about her. Gertie and I had gotten to know each other editing the Nursing Homes newsletter. I was the English major come receptionist, she was the retired secretary. Gertie was unmarried, had no children, and no family in the area. The newsletter gave her purpose and gave me a creative outlet. We were a couple of administrative pros, separated by a couple of generations and a shared disinterest in Comic Sans. You couldn't add an extra space after a period in any community publication without Gertie finding out. She carried a ruler in her handbag to measure margins on the go, and Lord help you if you started a sentence with a conjunction. My shift had started at 3 p.m., and Gertie would be promptly at my desk at 3.01, a stack of papers on her walker, a red pen tucked behind her ear, and a look of disdain. Poetry is unamusing, yet we're obligated to publish it, she said, licking her index finger and flipping through the first few pages. Can you have these retyped before I come down for dinner at 4.30? Absolutely, I said. And I always did. We had continued this song and dance of newsletter editing week after week for over a year. By the second year, Gertie would arrive in a wheelchair at my desk at 3.02, a stack of papers in her lap, a red pen tucked in a messy bun, and a look of defeat. It's yours now, she said one day, handing me a rough copy of the upcoming week's submissions. The pages rattled in her quivering hands. Narrow margins, 0.5 inch, don't forget. She nodded pointedly at me, a little smirk on her face, making sure I understood. I did. By the following week, I had a polished, crisp, freshly printed copy of the final newsletter and had looked forward to surprising Gertie on my day off. Instead, I woke up with a start, realizing my alarm hadn't gone off and that my lights were out. My cell phone hadn't charged. That had never happened before. Everything was suddenly dead. My heart was pounding and I felt disoriented. I felt a nagging urge to get to the nursing home quickly. I scrambled to get myself ready and into the car, the dashboard clock reading 8.30. With the newsletter on the seat next to me, I raced to the office, taking the stairs to bypass the elevator and go straight to her side of the unit. As I knocked and peered into her room, I was surprised to see that it had already been cleaned out. A new pair of sheets on the bed, like fresh paper. There was the faint smell of bleach. I looked into the hallway and confirmed the room number. Where does she go? I asked a passing nurse. Did someone change the font on the menus again? The nurse's face fell. She looked at her clipboard and tapped a note saying, Oh no, Gertrude passed away last night. It was in her sleep. Well, I'll be darned. I looked up at the ceiling with a smirk. Lights out, eh? Thank you. I know you cared for her well. The nurse gave a somber nod in reply and continued walking. She had a red pen tucked behind her ear. It was just that kind of subtle wit I loved about Gertie. I left her room, turning the lights out behind me. I had a newsletter to publish. In the summer of 1949, a geologist named Vadim Kolpikov discovered a strange feature on the surface of the Earth in the badaibo irkutsk region of southeastern Siberia. Encircled by a largely treed area, this anomaly is oval with a conical crater that contains a small, ball-like mound in its middle. The entire structure consists of broken gray limestone. Its width is between 130 and 160 meters while the cone is up to 80 meters high. Oddly, few trees grow on the formation, however the surrounding conifers have experienced rapid growth. Named the Potomsky Crater, the Kolpikov Cone, and the Fire Eagle Nest, the geological mystery has baffled scientists who are uncertain of what caused this weird formation. Named for the river that runs near the anomaly, the Potomsky Crater has spawned many interesting theories. Wild ideas speculated that it was a secret Stalin-era uranium mine that used gulag labor forces. Ancient astronaut theorists chimed that it was the landing site of an alien UFO. 
Other popular theories include an underground uranium or natural gas explosion, a dust-sized meteorite that burrowed through the planet and left the crater as an exit wound, a cylindrical metallic object of unknown origin, and the Tunguska event. The uranium theory may sound unlikely, however, this area is known to be rich in naturally occurring radioactive elements. A precise series of events would need to take place in order to create the circumstances for an explosion, but it lies within the realm of possibility. However, the trees do not indicate large explosions from uranium or the Tunguska event which would have leveled the conifers. By far, the theory most out of this world involves some kind of external or alien body that long ago embedded itself in the Potomsky crater, causing the unique shape. The unremarkable radiation levels seem to contradict this, though, as an object from space would leave far higher radioactive levels than the typical levels on Earth. Of course, one could counter this by saying that the spacecraft landed so long ago that by now high levels have returned to nominal. This is supported by the increased size of the vegetation surrounding the site. The two most reasonable theories that initially arose stated that the origin is volcanic or meteoric. The problem is that scientists have not found any evidence of either scenario on the slopes of the Siberian crater yet. There is no volcanic rock, no meteor debris anywhere. Nonetheless, the site reminded scientists of the meteor impact marks on the moon and believed that evidence lay deeper in the Earth where the meteor would have exploded. By now, the majority of the evidence has ruled out a meteor, and most scientists have abandoned this theory. Although remote, the Irkutsk region has an indigenous population called the Yakut. These people consider the crater a bad place, and they insist that large animals do not go into the area. One theory about this superstition suggests that perhaps their ancestors were present at a time when the area had a far higher radiation level. These ancestors may have become ill and died from this radiation. Over time, the legend was synthesized into oral tribal stories that became a part of the Yakut culture. In fact, the Yakut gave the crater the name Fire Eagle's Nest because of its shape. Although discovered in 1949, the first scientific expedition committed to properly investigating the Potomsky Crater wasn't launched until 2005. There were a number of reasons for this delay, whereas in many other countries an anomaly of this magnitude would have been a scientific focus. Until the Soviet Union fell, expenditure on scientific activity focused on military development. Consequently, the study of the crater was postponed. The initial expedition in 2005 met with a major setback when not long after embarking for their target, the lead researcher, Eugeny Vorobyov, died on the trail. When officials recovered his body, an autopsy showed a massive heart attack. Nonetheless, a bad omen or not, the group pressed on. Although scientists studied the area thoroughly, it only provided more possibilities. At that time, they were unable to make conclusive determination about its cause. Interestingly, though, a number of anomalies were discovered in the surrounding area. Because it was around the beginning of the Cold War, the Russian government was originally concerned this could be the site of a nuclear test by another nation. After all, the Americans had only made their nuclear debut over Japan three years prior, and it was an open secret that the Russians were attempting to create the same technology. Subsequently, one of the first things officials searched for at the site was increased levels of radiation. However, the results were unremarkable. Although fractionally above nominal, the amount in no way indicated a nuclear blast. What is perplexing, though, is that the surrounding vegetation experienced a sharp increase in size for over a century before its discovery. Whilst sounding benign, this anomaly is common in instances of nuclear contact. The mutagenic properties of radiation affect the size of flora, often dramatically increasing it over time. This was also the cause in the vegetation around Chernobyl. Magnetic anomalies are also present on and in the surrounding vicinity of the odd Potomsky crater. However, of course, there are other causes of tree growth spurts. Modern geomorphologists believe the Fire Eagle's Nest may be a very rare gas volcano, acting as a vent for vast stores of underground gases. The odd rock formations may also be indicative of chemical reactions between elements on the surface and those leaking through deep in the earth. 
Dmitry Demesko, Institute of Geophysics, Ekaterinburg, proposes that the crater formed in two phases. First, the tectonic actions in the area created a type of channel similar to mud volcanism. Then, over time, repeated freezing and thawing caused the rock to break up. One of the most recent studies published in 2015 in a paper by V. S. Antipin, B. G. Pokrovsky, and A. M. Fedorov concludes that the formation occurred from one or more explosions of steam as magma moved up through water and rock or when fissures released pressurized water trapped in the rock. Little by little, experts are getting closer to conclusively solving this puzzling mystery once and for all, if they haven't already. Something all scientists appear to agree on is that there is nothing like the Potomsky Crater anywhere else on the planet. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell someone about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do, and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. If you missed any part of tonight's show or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes which I've already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. Planet Werewolf was written by Leah Rose Emery for Graveyard Shift. The Dark Side of Fairies is by Amber Foy for Ranker. The American Stonehenge was by Mahai Andrea for ZME Science. What Caused the Potomsky Crater is by Lachlan McClelland for Historic Mysteries. And The Red Pen was written by Jersey Beth for Paranormality Magazine. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And a final thought. Sometimes we pray for God to change a situation when God wants the situation to change us. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>